Welcome to Dr. Will's History Road Trip. On this installment of Dr. Will's History Road Trip, we're going to do the second in our American Biography series. And this time, the subject of our biography is a man that you probably have not heard a whole lot about, uh, but he's a very important, significant figure in history for a number of reasons. And I'm talking about a man named Robert Smalls. Now, you probably haven't heard a lot about him because uh, Smalls was born a slave and he made a, a daring escape from slavery during the Civil War and eventually rose to become a U.S. congressman. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about his story because he represents the generation of black Americans after the Civil War, this generation of freedmen that really took advantage of the opportunities that they had had for the very first time, you know, the opportunity to participate in government, to vote, hold office, and be active in public life. So a little background on Robert Smalls. He was born into slavery on April the 5th, 1839 in Beaufort, South Carolina. His mother was named Lydia Polite. She was a slave belonging to a man named Henry McKee. Some people believe that Henry McKee was Robert's father. Now, Robert grew up in town in Beaufort. His mother lived in a house behind the McKee house. But at the age of 12, at his mother's request, Robert's master sent him up to Charleston to hire out as a laborer for a dollar a week. Now, this was not an uncommon practice, especially for, for urban slaves. Many times, uh, your master would send you to go do a job, you get paid for it, and then you turn the wages over to the master. Frederick Douglass, famous black orator from the 19th century and anti-slavery advocate, the same thing had happened to him in Baltimore. He had been a slave, and then he was hired out to work on the docks in Baltimore. Same would be true um, somebody I did some research on, a former governor of Texas named Orrin M. Roberts. When he was a student at the University of Alabama in the 1830s, he took his slave Prince to Tuscaloosa with him, Prince was hired out to work on a steamboat, and that's partially what helped pay for Orrin's tuition and room and board and upkeep at the University of Alabama. So this is not something that was uncommon. Um, you know, the, the slave tended to benefit a little bit. He got a little bit of more freedom than you would out in the fields where you're supervised constantly. Um, Robert first got a job working in a hotel. Then he's, he worked as a lamplighter in Charleston, you know, going around. That's back when the lights were all gas. They weren't electric. And then he got a job on the Charleston docks as a longshoreman. He worked several jobs on the docks, but he eventually became a helmsman on boats going in and out of Charleston Harbor. And that was not something many slaves got the chance to do. Apparently, he was very good at his job. Now, during his years in Charleston, he also married a lady named Hannah Jones, she was a slave as well. She had been hired out to work as a maid in the hotel. Okay. Up to that point in his life, that's about all we know about, about Robert Smalls. We don't know a whole lot about, about his early life because slaves weren't allowed to learn to read or write. They weren't able to keep records and that kind of thing. What really changed Robert's life was the Civil War. In April 1861, the Civil War began in Charleston, and Robert Smalls would have been somewhere in town. And it began when Confederate batteries fired on Union troops at Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Later that fall, Robert Smalls was given the helm of a, a boat called the CSS Planter. It was a Confederate military transport. And what this ship did is it delivered dispatches, troops, and supplies along coastal waterways close to the shore, um, out of the range of the Federal blockading fleet. As many of you probably already know, when the Civil War began, one of the first actions President Abraham Lincoln took was to blockade the southern coastline to try to prevent cotton leaving the South and going to Europe to be and being used to pay for weapons and equipment and that kind of thing. He also wanted to keep weapons and equipment from coming into the South. Now, apparently none of the Confederate officers or other whites that Smalls worked with suspected him of plotting an escape. He seemed well-respected. He seemed content. And I, to me, that seems to be, a just in what I've been able to study, it appears to be a pattern among urban slaves, and I think a, a lot of slaves in general. Uh, many slave owners in the 19th century believed that their slaves were happy and content and saw them as part of the family. Well, they believed that because what, that's what the slaves wanted them to see. If you were a troublemaker as a slave, or you caused problems, or you let it be known that you didn't like your situation, 
you'd be singled out for punishment. Well, slaves weren't stupid. They did what they had to do to get by. And many times they, they seem to be very happy and content. When in reality, nobody wants to be a slave. Well, Smalls and other urban slaves, I believe, were especially um, prone to wanting to be free because they had a little taste of freedom. And if you ever read Frederick Doug any of Frederick Douglass's autobiographies, he mentions this. He uh, Frederick Douglass lived with a lady who taught him how to read. And he, he said something to the effect in one of his autobiographies. He said, she didn't know it, but when she taught me to read, she killed the slave within me. In other words, once he realized that there was a wider world out there, he was capable of rational thought. He was just as smart as anybody else. He'd never be content to be a slave again. Probably a similar process happened with Robert Smalls. Okay? He's exposed to more education, able to move about more freely. It also makes it easier to escape because people are used to seeing him coming and going. And that doesn't cause any alarms. It's, that's the way Frederick Douglass escaped. At some point in early April of 1862, Smalls began planning his escape. He let some of the other slaves on his crew in on the plot. Uh, there were eight slaves on this crew on the planter. There was only one that he didn't let in on the plot because he didn't trust the guy. Well, on May the 12th of 1862, the planter was docked in Charleston Harbor. The three white officers on the ship left to spend the night in town. Smalls and the other slaves asked permission to have their families come and visit them on the boat. Now, they'd done this several times before. Again, not suspicious at all. Permission was granted them with the caveat that the families leave before curfew. So when the families, and Smalls was married, um, he, I think he had at least one child at this point, and several of the other slaves did too. When the families arrived on the boat, the men revealed the plan to them. It was the first time any of the women or families knew that there was going to be an escape attempt. Some of them were very scared, but there's there no backing out at this point. Now, at some point before curfew, three of the crew members, three of the slave crew members, pretended to escort the women home, but then they circled back around and hid them on board another ship in Charleston Harbor. About 3 o'clock in the morning on May the 13th, Smalls began to make his escape. He put on the captain's hat and jacket sailed past the wharf, picked up his wife and children and the other slaves from the, the boat where they had been hiding, and then headed out of the harbor. They had to get past five forts or batteries to get into the open Atlantic to the Union blockading fleet. And because Smalls had been on this boat and had done this many times before, he was able to give all the correct signals to these forts. As they had passed the forts, the forts would call out for a sign or a signal. Smalls was able to give it to them. Um, the last one he had to pass was Fort Sumter. And that was, the, of course, the one farthest out, closest to the open ocean. That was the site of the battle that, that sparked the Civil War. And that was the last one he had to pass. The fort didn't suspect anything until the planter was well out of range. Smalls was able to give the correct signals. And once he got out of range of Fort Sumter's guns, he had the Confederate flag lowered, and he raised a bed sheet that his wife had brought, basically a flag of surrender, and he sailed directly for the nearest ship of the blockading fleet, the USS Onward. Now, by that point, Fort Sumter gave the alarm, but it's too late. They're, they're already out. And when he sailed right under the guns of the USS Onward, Smalls called out for the captain, asked to speak to the captain. The captain leans over, and Smalls said, Good morning, sir. I brought you some of the old United States guns, sir and Robert Smalls had made his successful escape. And that's pretty daring. Not many slaves tried to escape, because if you get caught, <laughs> um, you're going to be beaten within an inch of your life if you're lucky. Um, well, this made the news all over the North. As news of this exploit spread beyond Charleston, he was hailed as a hero in the North. By the way, the three white officers were, were court-martialed for, for allowing this to happen. But Congress awarded Smalls and his crew the prize money for the planter. They actually gave them the money. Back then, when you captured an enemy ship, um, you got prize money for it, and it was given to Smalls and his crew. His share came out to about $1,500. He then spent the rest of the war serving various capacities in the United States Navy and Army along the South Carolina coast. On board the planter, they, they eventually they didn't give him command of the ship, of course, uh, they, they're going to give that to a white officer, but he would be the helmsman. He knew the ship better than anybody else, and um, the captain trusted his judgment. In 1864, he took the planter to Philadelphia for repairs. 
And while he was in that city, he started learning to read and write. He also, in Philadelphia, realized that discrimination against black people wasn't just a thing in the South. While he was in Philadelphia, he was ordered to give up his seat on a Philadelphia streetcar to a white person. Now, that the way those streetcars worked is you had seats that were covered, and then there was like an open platform at the very back, and he was ordered to go to the open platform, and he decided rather than go to that open platform, he'd just get off and walk. You know, he had a bit of pride about him, as you would imagine. After all, by this point, the man's a war hero, okay? So after the Civil War ends, now Smalls returns to Beaufort, his hometown, and he purchased, he actually purchased his former owner's home. Uh, union authorities had previously seized that home for the owner's refusal to pay taxes. So he actually grew up in, in the house that his, his master, or, or he, he bought the house that his master was living in while he grew up. And his mother lived with him for the rest of her life until she passed away. Uh, later, when uh, Mrs. McKee, his former owner's wife, after, after the former owner died, uh, she became pretty destitute, and Smalls let the family move back into the house because they didn't have any money. So it, it shows that he's got a magnanimous side to him as well. He also purchased a two-story building in Beaufort to use as a school for black children. And he, he gets involved in numerous business ventures, including the ownership of the newspaper in Beaufort. I believe it would have been the first black-owned newspaper in that city. In addition to being involved in numerous business ventures, Robert Smalls also got involved in politics as a Republican. In 1867, Congress began to block Andrew Johnson's plans for Reconstruction and instituting their own. And Reconstruction is complicated as all get out, but just in case you've never studied it that much, originally Abraham Lincoln believed that it was the president's job to run Reconstruction. When he's assassinated, his vice president, Andrew Johnson, takes over. He believes the same thing. Congress didn't. Uh, several members of the Republican Party in Congress, like Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, what you'd call radical Republicans, they believed that Lincoln was too lenient on the South. They wanted to take over Reconstruction and make it a lot harsher. Um, and they also wanted to extend the vote to the freedmen, which is something more moderate Republicans weren't ready to do yet. Democrats certainly opposed um, well, in 1867, Andrew Johnson had angered so much of Congress that the radical Republicans were able to override all of his vetoes. They, they had two-thirds majority in both houses of Congress. Uh, they passed laws like military, the Military Reconstruction Act of 1867, which placed the former Confederate states under military rule until they met a number of requirements like ratifying the 14th Amendment the 14th Amendment, among other things, basically says that states had to, to provide equal protection under the law to all their citizens, okay? white as well as black. And that was meant to combat laws southern states were passing called black codes, which basically were a separate set of laws that only applied to their black citizens. Okay? Uh, it, like I mentioned, they also gave the right to vote to the freedmen. And once freedmen were able to vote, Republicans gained the hand in southern politics for a few years, particularly in states like South Carolina, which had a large black population. If I'm not mistaken, South Carolina during these days actually had a uh, larger black population than a white population. Once the Republicans took over these southern states, most of these states then held new constitutional conventions and wrote new constitutions. Okay? They, they wanted to get rid of the constitutions that had been written directly after the war or the southern states had instituted things like black codes. Um, Smalls was a delegate to the South Carolina Constitutional Convention in 1868. Uh, he advocated in that convention for free compulsory education for all South Carolina children, which was written into that constitution. He then served in both houses of the South Carolina legislature from 1869 to 1873. And then in 1874, he won election to the U.S. House of Representatives um, served two terms from 1875 to 1879, and then several other terms. I'll, I'll get in a minute to, to uh, his, very, his career in Congress. Prior to 1876, most of Small's um, efforts in Congress were, were fighting efforts to remove federal troops from South Carolina. By the time you got to 1876, all but three southern states had met Congress's requirements for Reconstruction which by that point was not only ratifying the 14th Amendment, 
but also ratifying the 15th Amendment, which said that we extended the right to vote to blacks, basically said you could not be denied the right to vote on uh, the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. By the time you get to 1876, there's only three states left that have federal troops in them, South Carolina, Florida, and Arkansas, because they had not ratified the 15th Amendment yet. Um, Smalls was worried that once federal troops left his state, that the freedmen would be exposed, they wouldn't have anybody protect them, and they would um, suffer massive voter fraud, they would be intimidated into not voting, and that kind of thing. Uh, he also, in Congress, proposed legislation to integrate the U.S. Army, but that failed as well. The Army would remain segregated until Harry Truman integrated it in 1948. Well, after the Compromise of 1877, which, which ended the presidential election of 1876, and don't have time to get into it here, but read up on it, and I'll probably do a, a video on it before long. After that compromise, federal troops left South Carolina and then Democrats could regain control of the state legislature. In 1878, Smalls was charged with bribery. He was charged with bribery over the awarding of a printing contract five years earlier. Um, he may or may not have intended bribery. More than likely, he just awarded a contract to a friend. We're not, you know, it's, it's kind of fuzzy. But he's charged with bribery. He gets a pardon from the governor of South Carolina as part of an agreement that also pardoned Democrats for election fraud. The Democrats had committed a massive electoral fraud in South Carolina during the 1876 election, um, which is part of the reason that election was such a mess. Well, he was in Congress at that time, but that scandal hurt him politically. And in 1878, he lost his re-election bid to a Democrat named George Tillman. Um, he lost to Till, and by the way, Tillman was a hardcore, uh, I don't know any other way to put it, Tillman and his younger brother Ben were pretty hardcore racist. Um, I realize that racial attitudes were different in the 19th century. Even by the standards of the 19th century, the Tillmans were, were pretty virulent racist. And so the, these elections between Tillman and, and Robert Smalls, a freed slave, were, were they got to be pretty nasty. But this scandal hurt Smalls, and he lost that re-election bid in 1878. He ran against Tillman again in 1880 and lost again. But in 1882, he actually beat Tillman. He, he regained the seat. After that, um, the South Carolina legislature gerrymandered some districts, and they, they redrew some of the congressional districts, and Smalls was in the district now that was mostly dominated by uh, the, the district was majority black. In other words, they, they don't want a guy like Tillman to lose again. So they basically just grouped as many of the black counties as they could together. And Smalls won an election to that congressional seat in 1884. Um, and after that term, he, he left Congress. In 1890, President Benjamin Harrison would appoint Smalls to be the collector of the Port of Beaufort. And a lot of times that was something that was given... That was a position, these port collector jobs that would be given to people who had been loyal party operatives. And, of course, Smalls had been a loyal Republican. He would hold that position until 1913, except for the years 1893 to 1897. That's when you had a, a Democratic president, Grover Cleveland, in charge, who, of course, appointed a Democrat to that position. Smalls was also a delegate to the, to the 1895 South Carolina Constitutional Convention. So he'll be a delegate at two constitutional conventions. Now, why are they writing a new constitution in 1895 when they had just written one less than 30 years earlier in 1868? Many southern states wrote new constitutions during the 1890s and early 1900s. Uh, and frankly, in an effort to take away any political influence or voting rights black citizens may have. Southern states in the 1890s had become very along, alarmed by the populist movement of the 1890s. The populist movement was a third party movement and it had the potential to be a biracial coalition. There were there were black populists, some populists actively courted black voters. Well, that scared white Southern Democrats quite a bit. They had only recently retaken their states over from Republicans. They don't want to lose it again. So during the 1890s, you start to see most Southern states write new constitutions and in these constitutions, they find sneaky ways to get around the 14th and 15th Amendment. Um, things like poll taxes, 
or you have to pay a poll, um, you have to pay a tax in order to vote. Now, that'll disfranchise some white voters too, but that's okay because who's likely to vote populist? It would be poor white farmers and poor black farmers. And we'll, we'll probably cover the populist movement in the video at some point. But this time, Smalls wasn't able to do a lot. He wasn't able to do enough to stop the disfranchisement of his people. Um, he was only one of five delegates at the 1895 convention. He did give a very eloquent defense of black South Carolinians during this convention. I just want to read you his quote very quickly. He says, quote, my race needs no special defense. For the past history of them in this country proves them to be the equal of any people anywhere. All they need is an equal chance in the battle of life, end quote. Ultimately, however, he was unsuccessful in staving off the disfranchisement of black South Carolinians in the institution of the Jim Crow period in the history of that state. And then his health started to suffer as well. During the 1890s, Smalls began suffering from diabetes. He, he was a fairly large man, pretty heavy guy. Um, he had wound up dying in 1915 from a combination of diabetes and malaria. But for the rest of his life, he remained active in Republican politics while he didn't necessarily hold office. He served as delegates to several uh, Republican nominating conventions. He wrote to a U.S. senator named Newt Nelson in 1912 this about his, his political affiliation, quote, I never lose sight of the fact that had it not been for the Republican Party, I never would have been an office holder of any kind, end quote. So I think Robert Smalls is an incredible individual. He led a very remarkable life. He's really important both as a window into what urban slavery was like, also as a window into the politically active black middle class between Reconstruction and Jim Crow. His exploits during the Civil War made him a hero in the North, and his efforts in government on behalf of black South Carolinians made him a hero to his people. Uh, he's buried today in the cemetery of Tabernacle Baptist Church in Beaufort, South Carolina, and there's a monument to him there. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Dr. Will's History Road Trip. If you like what I'm doing and want to continue following, please subscribe to my channel and click the notification button so you'll get updates when I post new content. Also, please consider supporting me via PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App. Your support will enable me to go to interesting places and film them and talk about them with you. Feel free to suggest locations that you might like to see me visit in the comments below. Thank you very much, and I'll see you on the road.